ourselves happy mother's day it's good to have my mom here with us today and my aunt valerie we're glad to have them in service with us this morning and let's just get in and worship god here today in this service and brother keith's taking that box out there ladies if they were someone didn't get one of these go by there and please pick one of them up and i guess if one of you guys want one of them little old pink boxes if there's any left <laughs> You can have one of them, but it's just left up to you. But don't let nobody see you, okay? It's good to be in the Lord's house this morning. If you have your Bible, turn with me, 2 Kings. I was praying this morning, and God just began to speak some things into our hearts. 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter number 4. God just began to... Uh, Early this morning, some speak some things into our spirit. And it is Mother's Day. And we're thankful for you ladies being here in service with us today. There's a very special mother that we're going to read about here this morning. Verse number 8. Said, and it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shulam. And it says, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as often as he passed by, that he turned in thither to eat bread. She said unto her husband, she said, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. Let us set for him there a bed a table and a stool and a candlestick and it shall be that when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither and it fell on a day that he came thither and turned into the chamber and he lay there and he said to Gehazi his servant he said call the Shulamite and when he had called her she stood before him he said unto her say now unto her behold thou hast been careful for us with all of this care for what is to be done for thee for wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captains of the host and she answered I dwell among my own people would you pray with us this morning Heavenly Father we thank you Lord today for this wonderful privilege this beautiful day God that you blessed us with Father we thank you for all of the mothers that's here today with us and we just ask you Lord now that you would anoint our lips to preach this gospel once again. I pray, God, that you would be our helper, be our leader, and be our guide. And God, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. What a powerful passage of Scripture that we read to you this morning. Verse number 8 says, And this woman was a great woman. I thought about that as I read that this morning. I thought about God. What a testimony she's left behind here for the Word of God to say that about her. And I begin to think about what makes you and I have a great home. I begin to think about that as I was just spending time in the Word of God. Church, I believe that it's very vital to you and I to have a godly home and a godly life. A godly home begins with a godly life. Amen. It begins in that right there. When we put God first in our life and then we allow the Lord to be God of our home. Now, you do realize that, that when we begin to allow God to be the Lord of our life and allow Him to be God of our home, we all like the blessings that comes along with that. We like what God does in our life and in the lives of our children and our family. But saints of God, we got to realize that that's a choice that you and I make. I am I'm convinced. Now, we go through each one of us, each family goes through troubles, they go through trials, but if they will allow God to be the Lord of their life, that would be the advice that I'd give to any 
any young person sitting out there, young or old, that would be the advice that I'd give them. If someone was to ask, what's the secret to a, to a good marriage and a good home? I'll tell you there's a secret. The secret's Jesus Christ. When you put him in your life, when you allow him to be the Lord of your life and the God of your home, then you raise up those children to realize that this is what we not just do, but this is what we live. This is the way that we live our life. There's no compromise to that. There's going to be some things that's going to be hard. There's going to be some things that you're going to have to stand up against and say, we're not going to do that. And the reason that we don't do that is because of what we believe. The reason that we don't allow maybe the kids to go places and do things is because of what we believe. There's a standard there to be lived. And child of God, that's exactly the way that we need to live our life. You say, well, preacher, is that all so important? I can assure you this morning, mom and dad, it's important. When you instill that life in your children, now get this this morning, you can't save your kids. You can't save them. Jesus Christ is the only one that can do that. He'll send the Holy Ghost to convict and if they'll obey that and respond to the convicting power of the Holy Ghost of heaven, then God will definitely save them. But you and I can't do that by ourselves. We can be saved, but we can't save our children. But I can tell you this this morning, mom and dad, when you raise them up and you train them and you teach them in the ways of God, the Bible said when they're old, they'll not depart from that. They will remember what it is in your life, mom and dad, that made things special. They will remember the hard times maybe that they have saw you go through, the difficult situations that they have saw you overcome and they will see how that you handled it, how you trusted God, how you lived for God, went right on through the, through the adversity, went right on through the problem in life, went right on and continued to walk with God and to love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind and your spirit. I begin to think about this little lady here, the little Shulamite lady. The Bible teaches us here in 2 Kings chapter 4 and it said she was a great woman and one that constrained him to eat bread and it said and so it was that as often as he passed by that he turned in thither to eat the bread. This lady had made a place on the outside of their house out there a little, a little old shelter on the outside wall for the man of God. You say preacher it don't seem like much. We ain't done with 2 Kings 4 alright. You say it don't seem like too much of a place but outside that wall there that mom had invited the presence of God you say how's that she invited the man of God to have a place at their home he's got a place here and he when he comes by now Elisha said to Gehazi's servant he said ask her are there anything that we can do for you can we go to the king can we go to the captain is there anything that you maybe you have a need of and Gehazi turns to the prophet to the man of God and he said she doesn't have any children and Elisha prays for, for her but he tells her there he said at about this time or about this season next year he said you're going to have a son the little shooter my lady says to him she said oh and I'm paraphrasing here she said oh don't be don't just be teasing with me don't just tell me that no about this time next year you're going to have a son the Bible said that her husband was older in age and this time but this woman desired a son and we find here that this home had a place in it for the presence of God. Can I tell you something mom and dad tonight American homes still needs that today. Amen. The homes in America would be different around this globe if there was a place for God in it. Amen. That if mom and dad would stand up square their shoulders and say listen we're going to serve God. Joshua said, Joshua 24, he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Can I tell you something, mom and dad, that still do good to ring from your kitchen table every day that you sit down. We're still going to serve God here. Amen. 
It doesn't matter what somebody over yonder does or the people down the street or those next door. As for this house, we're going to serve God. When the church house doors is open, we're going to be there. We're going to worship God. We're going to honor God. We're going to praise him and we're going to glorify him. You, the kids say, well, we don't like that. And the world's ideology and the world's thinking is, well, we want to do everything to keep everybody happy. Can I tell you something, folks? We need to serve God. It doesn't matter who it offends or who it makes unhappy. Why is that? Because he's king of kings and he's lord of lords. He is the soon returning king of this whole earth. And brother, sister, when I look over yonder in that Middle East and I see the turmoil that's a brewing and that's a rising in there. If ever there was an hour that it needs to be taught in the church and preached from the pulpits of this globe right now, it's in this season that you and I live. Mom and dad, it still needs to ring up the lips of the parents and the household of God to let them know that there's a consequence for sin and there's a reward for living right. Amen. There's a consequences to those that don't and a rewarding to those that do for those that live right and godly in Christ Jesus. One of these days is going to inherit an eternal home in the presence of God and the splendor and all of his glory and those that don't live godly will live there, spend the rest of their time and all of eternity in a place of torment. Amen. Needs to be taught them. Needs to be told to them that. Needs to be explained to them that. You moms teach your daughters how to cook. You teach them how to do things around the house. The dads teach their sons maybe how to take care of this side or the other. But listen to me, church, forever there was an hour that there's something needs to be taught. It's a godly living. It's a life to be lived before them. That training them is not telling them. It's not telling them, well, you need to do this and you need to do that. I've had a lot of people to do that. But can I tell you something that carries the weight behind it? It's when they live it day in and day out and they walk in it themselves. That's what impresses me. It doesn't impress me one iota for somebody to tell me oh, how it ought to be and how it should be. But brother, you let me see them live it. You let me see them walk day by day through this whole course of life and they live that thing, brother. That's the thing that impresses me. It leads me to know that it's more than a good speech. It's more than a popular word. It's down on the inside of them now. It's not a head knowledge about God, but it's a heart knowledge about him. And it's that heart knowledge that we follow through to the believing in Jesus Christ and living in the things that God would have us to do. Amen. I thought about what it said, this lady here in the word of God. It became a way of her life. We picked up here in verse number eight. But it says this in verse number nine. She said to her husband, Behold, now I see, I perceive this is a holy man of God. Elisha had an impact on them to the point that she wanted to make a place there for him. Bible said a little chamber was made on the wall and they, they set him up a bed and a table and a little stool and a light there. And as the man of God and his servant passed by, they would stop and spend the night and then go on their way. Verse 13 says, and he said unto him, he said, say now unto her, behold, thou hast been careful for us. Now notice this, with all this care for what is to be done for thee. What is to be done for thee? I begin to think about that. The Bible said that she'd been careful. Elisha did for us and for all of this, for all this care that you've taken for us. What's to be done for thee? This son that this mom was to be given. Bible says that he began to grow. Let's pick it up here in verse 17. It said, And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her according unto the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said unto his father, he said, My head, my head. And he said to the lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knee till noon and then died. 
Wouldn't that be a sad story if it ended there? Verse 21 says, She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. And she shut the door upon him and went out. She didn't put him on her bed. She didn't put him on dad's bed. But she took him and she laid him upon the bed of the man of God. Amen. Placed him there. Have you ever walked into the house of God and just walked through the door and immediately you could feel the presence of the Holy Ghost? Have you ever just walked in, just stepped in? I've walked in the building and just walked in because this is a place that's designated of worship. You realize this is not just any house. This is not just any place, but this is a place that's designated that believers come just like you and I and we gather in here week by week and we gather at time and we come into this house to worship God. We worship Him in song. We worship Him in word. We study the word. We preach. We teach. And we worship God. We have a life in Christ Jesus. But it's a place that we come together and assemble ourselves together as believers. That presence of God that's here. That richness. That realness. I've walked in here. There wouldn't be anybody here but me. I'd walk in here and my spirit be reverenced and I could could feel the presence of God. That's why she took the lad back to Elisha's room. Why is that? Because of the presence of God that was on the man of God's life. This is a place he's been. This is a place that we set aside for him. She knew no doubt there's been a many a time that the man of God has prayed and heaven come down. This is where it all began. She took that lad back there laid him in the man of God's bed. Now listen what she done here in verse number 22. And said she called her husband and said send me I pray thee one of the young men and one of the asses that I may run to the man of God and come again. Now notice this what she said I'm going to do. I'm going to run to the man of God. She didn't mention to the husband about the boy. She didn't mention that the boy is not with us anymore. But she said send me one of the young men that they go get one of the donkeys get him saddled and get things ready I'm running to the man of God listen to this and it said and he said wherefore wilt thou go to him today you mean you're going to go today and she said this and she said it is neither new he said it is neither the new moon nor the sabbath and she said it she said it shall be what well now notice the faith that this mama just said. She said, it shall be well. That's verse 23. Now ladies and gentlemen, I've got to say to you, most would be in total pandemonium. But this mama sent for the servant. She said, saddle me the donkey. We're going to the man of God. And she said, it shall be well. Why is that? Because she knew in the God in whom that she had believed. Amen. She knew that the God that gave her this young boy was also able to raise him up from the dead. Amen. She knew that the very God that was able to bring Isaac back out out of the ashes was the same one that was able to do for her what he said. You remember the story there. Abraham was going to take his son's life and he, and he said he believed that God would raise him up even from the ashes. God said that's good enough Abraham. I believe you've got the faith. Amen. This mama had that same type of faith in knowing that the man of God's going to pray to the king of glory. She, he's going to talk to God and God's going to do something. Her faith, child of God, made all of the difference in the world when she realized that I'm going to trust him. I can tell you something this morning, folks. There come a time in your life you're going to just have to walk by faith and not by sight. All you can see sometimes is the devastation that's there. Brother, when old Nehemiah went out to rebuild the wall, he said in the word of God, he said it's just heaps upon heap. I can tell you, but 
but he didn't look at the heap. He didn't look through the rubble. He saw a wall that could be built there. It's not my might nor my power, but it is by thy spirit. Saint of God that dwells, the spirit of God can move the wall of adversity. He can move in the devastating time of life and bring back God moved there for this lady's in this lady's life and God touched in that situation child of God her faith in the God of heaven made all the difference in the world and I can tell you it'll make all the difference in the world in my life and your life she said it shall be well and it says, and then she saddled the ass and she said to her servant, drive, go forward. And she said, slack not thy riding for me. Now you notice what she said. She said, don't you worry about me. Don't you slow down for anything. She said, except I bid thee. So she went and she came into the man of God, Mount Carmel. Said, and it came to pass that when the man of God saw her afar off, and he said to Gehazi, his servant, he said, Behold, yonder is a Shulamite. He said, Now run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well? Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? And is it well with the child? Notice what she said. It is well. The man of God said to his servant, he said, You go and ask her. Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? And is it well with the child? She answered with faith. It's well. Oh, church. What a relationship this little. Is it any wonder that it could be said she was a great woman? The faith that was there. It's well. How can it be well? How can this be well? She knew if God was in it, everything's going to be all right. She said, don't, she told the young man, she said, don't you slack up riding. You ride as hard as we can go unless I, don't you slow down. We got to get there. She goes to the man of God, falls at his feet. And, and, and Gehazi reaches down and draws her back. Because she's done ask her, is everything all right? All's well. But when she comes to Elisha, she falls at his feet and he, and, he, and he brings her back. And he says, let her alone. And he says, it must, this God must have hid this from me about the child. He tells the servant, he said, you run ahead of us and take my staff and lay it on the child. She explains to him what's going on. He takes the rod of, of, of Elisha back to that little chamber, back to that little place, back to that little home where they have built a little, a little shelter off to the edge. Walks in. There lays the son. He lays the rod upon, his, upon him and he goes back and he meets him and he tells him, What's there? But the man of God continues on. Say, preacher, does it make a difference? I just ask you. Does it make a difference? It says, and she went and she came into the man of God in Mount Carmel. And it came to pass that when the man of God saw her far off, said to Gehazi and servant, Behold, yonder is a Shulamite. And it says, and we verse skipping on down to 27, and it said, and when he came into the man of God, to the hill she caught him by the feet but Gehazi came near and thrust her away the man of God said let her, let her alone for her soul is vexed within her and the Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me and then, then, said, then, said, then she said did I desire son of my Lord and did I not say do not deceive me and he said then he said to Gehazi gird up thy loins and take my staff in thine hand and go thy way that thou mayest meet in thy, if thou meetest any man neither salute him and if thou salute thee answer him not again and lay my staff on the face of the child and the mother of the child said as the Lord liveth and notice that 
And as thy soul liveth, I'll not leave thee. And he arose, and he arose and followed her. Gehazi passed by for them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but, the, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Now I want you to notice this. Wherefore he went again to meet him, and he told him, saying, The child is not awake. When Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. Verse 33 says, And he went in therefore, and he shut the door, them twain, and he prayed unto the Lord. And he went up, and he lay upon the child, and he put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned, and he walked into the house to and fro. And he went and he stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Now listen to that. It says, and then he returned, and he walked to and fro. He went up, stretched himself upon the child again. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi, and he said, Call a Shulamite. And so he called her, and when she was, was coming to him, he said, Take up thy son. Said, and she went, and she fell at his feet, and bowed herself to the ground, and took up her son, and went out. Friend, did it make a difference? Made a big difference in her life. What made the difference? It was the relationship that that mother had with the God of Elisha. It wasn't so much her relationship with the man of God, but it was her relationship with the God of the man. That's what makes a difference. That's what makes a difference. You see, we strive in this society... And this, I believe it's been referred to maybe as the American dream. To have a, a lot of things and pass it on down. Can I tell you something this morning, mom and dad, doesn't matter the size of your house. It doesn't matter the worth of it. It doesn't matter whether you own it or somebody else owns it. It doesn't matter whether you've got 500 acres of bottom land and 800 acres of good pasture. That's not going to matter to your children as much as knowing where mom and dad stood with God. Amen. That's not going to matter to them what's for, the, for somebody that's living right. It's not going to matter to them what's been left behind. It's not going to matter, but what will matter most is to know that mom and dad, I'll one day see them again. One day I'll spend, we've spent maybe 70, 80, 90, some maybe even 100 years here, but one day I'll spend eternity with them. I'll live with them in a state like I've never been before. They'll be perfectly whole and so will we. Can I tell you something, friend? It'll be worth it all. It's not going to matter what's been left here material but what's been left here spiritually. You've left something behind. You say, Pastor, I've raised my kids in the house of God. I brought them to the Lord's house. I've taught them the ways of God. They're not listening to it. They're not living in it. But can I tell you something, Mom and Dad? That teaching is still there. That, that, that remembrance of that's still there. You say, I don't know if they've ever heard it or not. I'll assure you they've heard that. They may have sat in Sunday school class from the time that they was big enough to go by themselves. They may have sat in the house of God as long as they were under your roof and when they left they got out into this world got just meaner than a junkyard dog and living out there in that world in all of its splendor and you're wondering about that. I can tell you something mom and dad you can rest assured that the word of God is truth. Amen. And you can stand on the word of God you can pray, God, bring back that word. What word is it, preacher? I don't know, 
and you don't either, but God does. God knows exactly that passage of Scripture that they can remember. I can tell you they can remember way more than you think they can. They can remember way more than they'll let you on like they can. But pray God stir up that word of truth on the inside of them. God begin to move that word again on the inside of them. Lord, let it ring in their ear day in and day out, night in and night out. God, let it be a part, Lord, every day that they get up. Let that word maybe that that Sunday school teacher said, that that preacher said, that that evangelist said, that the word that was in that song, let it ring in their ear. Let it be stirred in their heart and in their mind that they all know what the word says. I can tell you, mom and dad, but there's a, there's a clause to that. You must put them in the atmosphere, the presence of God. You must place that on, not only in your life and emphasis on it in your life, but put emphasis on it in your children's life. Amen? It'll make a difference. Amen? It'll make a difference not only in your family's life or your children's life, but it'll make a difference in your family as well. Listen to this. Passage of Scripture found in 1 Corinthians. I believe it is 1 Corinthians 7. I want to read this to you this morning if I can. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. And verse 14. It says, The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such case, but God hath called us to peace. It says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. What does that mean? And the unbelieving wife sanctified by the husband. That does not mean that they're saved. That means that they are sanctified. That means they are covered under the promises of God because of what's in your life. You do realize that when you became a married person, you became husband and wife, what did you become? One. You didn't become two. You were two. And because this Bible teaches you and I, when a man and a woman gets married, they become, they become one flesh. So because of that covenant, that marriage covenant's there, you became one. That unbelieving husband, now notice that, it shows that unbelieving person that's there is sanctified because of you. So are your children. That means there's promises there that pertain in their life, that there's, there's blessings in their life that they're probably not even aware of. Listen child of God, there's probably many sitting in here, some for sure sitting in here. You're the only one in your household serving God, but that household's covered with the covenant because of your relationship with God. Listen church, it matters to serve God. It's very important in our life. There's things there. It said that unbelieving husband sanctified because of the believing wife. That unbelieving wife is sanctified because of the unbelieving husband. That covenant there, they become one. They are now covered with that. They're not saved. They're still going to have to ask Jesus into their heart to make heaven their home. But they are covered with the promise, with promises of God. God can touch them, move in their life. You can pray for them and God touch their life. Listen, church, there's, there's some things that we have as men and women of God that God blesses us with daily. He loads our life. God, keep, not, God not only keeps us. God keeps the lost people, the, the people out there that sinners as well. But there's a covenant that you and I have. I guarantee you probably every mom and there are many of you moms anyway have stood up and said, God I plead the blood of Jesus over my family. You may have not realized what that meant but that's what you said. What were you saying? You're saying, God I'm asking your protection over my family through and by the blood of Jesus. 
Jesus Christ. I'm asking you, Lord, to take them and protect them and to keep them. What are you doing? You're giving the Spirit of God to lead way into your home. You're saying, God, I want you to be there. I want you, Lord, to work. I want you, God, to be the Lord of not only my life, but the Lord of my children's life. I want you, Lord, to protect them. You see, that's a promise that you can stand on because you're a child of God. I want you, Lord, to take control. I tell you, Saint of God, that's a wonderful thing. When you stand in need, you're saying, God, I want you to walk. I want you, Lord, to work in that. I want you, God, to move in this situation, in this circumstance in our life because, Lord, you're the one that can do it. I can tell you, friend, that's a great thing to hold on to. I thought about another great woman of God and it was the mother of Moses. I was reading there this morning about the life of Moses and I read down through there, Moses, all the babies were to be killed. All of them were to be taken out and kill the boys anyway. They were to be killed and they were to be taken out and destroyed. But Moses' mother took him. The Bible said after a period of time, after he'd grown to the point she couldn't hide him any longer, she took him and in the Nile River and put him out there in the midst of the bulrushes in a little basket there and set his sister by to watch him. Now you say, preacher, that would sound so that would sound so outrageous to do that, but you know something, friend? That mama had a covenant with God. That mama said the God that's brought us this far, the great I am, the one that's when he went, when Moses was to go back to the children of Israel when they live in an Egypt bondage. When Moses asked them, when he said to God, he said, who shall I say has sent me? He said, you tell them the I am the I, that I am has sent thee. That same I am dwelt with little Moses in that basket in the midst of the bulrush there and protected him. Oh friend, how could that be? God's fixing to raise him up a man right in the midst of the enemy's household because of the covenant that his mama had between him and God. Placed him right in the midst of Pharaoh's house. And get this, Pharaoh's daughter had compassion upon him when she passed by and saw him. And his sister ran up there and said, would you like for me to fetch a maid to raise this child for you? She said, I would. Lo and behold, Moses' mother came and raised him in the king's household. But not only did that mama place inside of him, you got to realize something. Here is a man that made a choice. He's living in the land of plenty. He's living where everything he's got at his disposal. He could, it could, the pendulum could swing either way. But the Bible said that Moses had rather suffer with the righteous than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And he chose the ways of God. Oh, brother, sister, I can tell you something. While mama had him down there taking care of him and nursing him as a little bitty, bitty boy, she's placing in his heart the things of God. What did he one day do? There would be a day that he'd go back and he would bring out the children of Israel out of Egypt's bondage. I can tell you, friend, it pays when we put God in our home and in our children's lives. Makes a difference. They probably, many will never remember you for the toys that you put in their life. Many of them may not remember the car that you bought them. When they're lying there on their deathbed and getting ready to walk out of this walk of life. But I tell you what they will remember who saves this soul. They will remember what Jesus has done and can do. And they live for Him. Makes a difference. Would you bow your heads with us this morning? Musicians, would you help me today? Having in and living in a godly home makes a difference.
As I was getting ready this morning to come to church and putting this word together and just outside on the carport walking around. I realized this morning across this building there's some ladies. You come week and week in and week out by yourself. You're doing your best to raise your kids right. Doing your best to bring them to the house of God and show them the right direction. Can I just encourage you this morning to continue on? Can I just encourage you to keep that up? You're instilling something in them this morning worth more than anything you can ever leave to them. What it means to be a child of God. Now then his head is bowed and eyes is closed. Maybe sitting here this morning. In a town called Shinnah. You say, Pastor, I've made some terrible mistakes raising my kids. But I want to make it different. The only thing they long for. I want to make it different. They would hold the sun as Elijah prophesied. I want to ask you something. One day. How's your relationship between you and God? The child to his mother. How is it between you and Christ? He held his head there on his knee until he died at noon that day. She didn't tell anyone. She ran. You need that in your life. Man of God. I wonder this morning across this place there'd be one. She replied along the way. You get up from your seat this morning. Where are you seated to come to this altar? It is well. Just say in your heart, Lord, I need you. I need you more than anything else. I need you more than anything else in my life. I need you, God. This altar's open this morning. In His presence I will dwell where it is well. You may be not living that life that you grew up under. And I just stood by the bedside where she lay the boy when he died. And may not be living like upon him and that mom that you grew up with lived. What made the difference? What made her so special? She walked with God. Loved God. Send you a miracle. And until then you can say Something would arise. What was her first suggestion? Let's pray about this. Let's pray about this. Let's talk to God. Talk to God. The promise that he 